where I have the vocal sample and the piano chords and the beat. I have the, the essence of the song, the hook I have, the importancy, the urgency. Ladies and gentlemen, please make some noise for the one and only Mike Magoo. Thank you, thank you. Uh, lovely that you're here to hear me speak. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling honored. Um, just for me to check, um, who has been producing less than a year? Hands. Mm, less than two, less than three, four, five, more than five years. Uh, okay, maybe you should be up here. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't been producing that long. Um, uh, and I, I, I have noticed um, when I'm at these uh, dance fair kind of seminars, I always see a lot of technical um, uh, production tutorials. Um, and I think um, also when I get demos, nowadays it's not so much anymore about the technical skill of a producer. It's way more about um, um, creativity and the choices that he or she makes. Sorry so to interrupt you, Mike, but we got Gmail on your face. So maybe it's easier if you stand up or... Oh. Because we got like blocks on your face. Yeah. So like do I need to... Yeah, perfect. Yeah, oh, that's better. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, um, um, so basically my, my idea was that... Uh, yeah, Gmail's still on my face probably. Um, uh, luckily, it's not my mom mailing me. This is actually me being prepared for this. <laughs> I mailed it to myself. Um, but um, um, so for me, the, the biggest um, part of being a, a musician or a producer or somebody who makes music is the um, uh, creative choices that um, he or she makes. So for me, creativity is about generating ideas on one hand. There's a technical aspect when you make music as well. And it's also about expressing yourself. And I don't mean expressing yourself in a kind of emotional way like a dancer would do, but expressing yourself in what your vision is on music and how you're going to, how, what your role is within the music world and um, um, finding a good uh, match between you and the music that you're releasing. So um, I'm honestly a bit nervous for this because it's, it might be a bit of a weird thing for me to just say what my creative ideas were for my tracks because it's, a lot of it is an unconscious uh, process. But I still kind of want to try and tap into that and see if you can benefit from it. Um, it might be really vague, but I'm hoping with examples that it will be kind of like um, uh, good for you to tap into. Um, I, one, uh, my, one of my goals is here is not to kind of teach you a lesson, like to really put forward a lesson, but for you to take something out of it. Because for me, making music is like a diet. You know, I can tell you what my best diet is, but it might not work for you. So it's just like everybody has to, has to have their own diet, has to have their own creative process. I can only show you what works for me and how I've been doing it and what my musical path was. And I hope that you can take out from it your own lessons. Um, so, <clears throat> basically, um, I wanted to um, show you how I started making music and where I am now. Um, give you two paths of my creative process and then at the end dissect two tracks within those two paths um, of, of how I make music. So, basically, I started um, just being a DJ um, before I started producing. Um, this was like a million years ago, before Facebook and everything. I was just DJing uh, vinyl and um, DJed at clubs. And I just loved um, digging for records that were sampled um, in hip hop. So like the funk and the disco tracks. And I used to collect them and then started DJing. Um, so that's how I kind of got my gigs. I collected like 30 records, went from pop to pop, asking if I could play the whole night, got like, 50 or 75 guilders, enough to buy some new records, and then that's how I continued that hobby. Um, but basically, it's already started with me finding samples and digging for uh, cool tracks. Um, so after a while, I started um, producing a bit. Um, I don't know if anybody knows this, but um, how I um, started producing was 
during the Baltimore and Booty era. Don't know if anybody knows the Be More Breaks Baltimore Club. Anyone? No, that's great. Ah, one, yes. Oh, finally. Okay, so that's kind of what, it, what, what people did, um, I think, in Jersey clubs and all these kind of things. They made like really lame um, remixes, club remixes of tracks. So this was one, just for an example. And it's the rhythm of the beat, the rhythm of the track that makes it a Baltimore track. So. Amazing, huh? Truly really special, this. Okay, so it's the rhythm. You know, the kick doesn't go forward to the floor, but it's, so that's a beamer rhythm. And obviously the thing break. So that's how I just started, you know, because I was DJing and I thought, okay, this is, this is kind of cool. I can do this. I can like chop up a song and make a beat under it. And, you know, I have something. Um, that's what I did. That's, how, that's, these were the first kind of records, remixes, bootlegs, what you call them, that I would play that were for myself. Um, so then I started um, obviously producing a bit more and then I just found out how I can, you know, um, because I'm a DJ at first, I love combining some elements and I, I like digging for records or for cool samples. So I'm going to show you just really quick how I um, uh, started my creative process more as a producer, which basically meant um, finding some cool vocal samples, some cool hooks or whatever, and then make a piano chord under it, make a bass uh, under it. I don't think that's rocket science per se, but it's more about why I make those decisions and why I think it works, which is a very, for me, it's a very vague uh, area. But just to give you kind of like an idea, after that whole Baltimore uh, rubbish, uh, I kind of started to make um, one of my first tracks, and that was the show. It first came out on my label, and then came out on spinning. Okay, so... Wait. Okay, so it's just starting for me finding a cool vocal, which you will hear now. So, okay, blah, 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 and then the drop. So for me, um, like, I won't go into why I make this, these melodies or that melodies. It's just basically having a vocal and finding chords around it and then making a bass. How I find the vocal, there wasn't splice back then. Um, so, 2.44. That's it. So I found a vocal on B-Port, um, just like really, really digging. Like I said, there wasn't spliced back then, so I didn't have like um, a really easy way to tap into vocals. But it's kind of like a cool way because I, I know that people aren't going to find this sample. So I know it's, if, if I make this right, if I can tune this right, if I can make this work, it will be unique. It will be something that... Um, uh, yeah, well, maybe just stand out, stand out a bit more than a, than a sample that's being used all, all the time. So another, um, um, for me, another uh, example uh, is a track called uh, The Gift, which I made here. I'm just going to show you here. I don't know if you know all these tracks, but... Okay, so I started out with just a bass line. By the way, this is a Mark Knight remix. I couldn't finish that track. I sent it to Mark Knight. He finished it. Um, but it was just a bass line that I made. And you make a bass line and you think like, oh, I need something. I might need uh, somebody that can preach like a cool 
um, some words on it that would, you know, have people go, okay, this track I'm going to remember. Um, so I just type in pre uh, preaching and, you know, next five, four or five hours I'm on the internet just listening to speeches and preacher mans. And then I found one really interesting um, preach from Montel Jordan. You know Montel Jordan? Uh, I kind of need some feedback. Do you know Montel Jordan? <laughs> yeah. No, you don't know. Okay. So Montel Jordan, uh, this is how we do it, had a, had a really big hit. He's actually now a preacher, preaching that music uh, can influence you in a very bad way and um, that it can be really female, unfriendly, and sexist. And in this speech, he says that he also is to blame, and now he has, he's, he's changed, and he's like saying that people, when they should make music, they should be really like uh, honest and open and not sexist and not all these kind of things, which I thought was kind of cool just to sample and put in music. So it's just him saying... It's because the rhythm of a song, the beat of a song affects your will, your movement into action, your behavior. It pulls you in, it draws you in, it compels you. Okay, so that's, that's in this song. There's power over you. Now let me tell you something. When you hear me even sing just those beats, I'm not singing words, I'm not giving you a lot of melody. I'm giving you a beat. As you hear that beat, something starts to happen. Okay, so again, not rocket science, how I do this. But for me, there's now an urgency in this track. I kind of made a creative twist in this track. So I think this track is important. It's important for me just as an artist, just by expressing myself, having like a cool rhythm and somebody that's saying that, uh, you know, um, uh, music can influence you. But it's said by a guy who, who's like saying it could also be a bad thing. And he's also bad. So for me, it's kind of like there's a, like a creative twist. There's a, there's a plot. There's an urgency to it. So it's not even a really good record. But for me, it's like something that is important. And um, I think... Uh, one of the most um, missed things nowadays is, you know, any, anyone can make a really good track, but there's got to be some importance, some urgency um, for people to listen to it. A track that you will go to, that you will, when, you, when, you, when you hear it, you'll go to your friends and go like, fuck, you got to check this track out. That's kind of like an, an urgency, an importance. That's that's the main thing that that uh, that makes people want to listen to a track. That's the main thing you you have to achieve if you want to make music, in my eyes. So, what I'm doing here is I have my I have found my creative base. I've laid my base. I have my importance for um, I found my urgency for the track for myself, hoping that other people will. But if no, if nobody will. I still have my importance for the track. I still have my urgency that I, that I think this track should be put out. Um, so really quick, just um, one more how I tap into a creative process next to just getting samples and putting them on a beat. Um, I sometimes have like um, uh, take references from tracks that are way different than what I make and then I try to make that mine. In this case, um, I heard this track from Gabriel Ananda. So what I immediately liked from this track is that it kind of it has an uh, arpeggiated lead which doesn't land. So it's it's continuing the whole time. It never like stops the circle, it's just continuously flowing and, and going on. And so for me, that's like, okay, that's something I want to do. How do I do that? Okay, I try to, try to recreate an, uh, an, an ARP going into my, yeah, you can see it all. I hope this is going to be loud enough. I think you have to put this a bit louder, sound guy. So this arpeggiator, it sounds different, it's not the same melody, but the concept of a bass line that's not landing, but still arpeggiating the whole time, that's something that I, that I wanted to create. So that's something I, I made my own. Um, I can sh show you quickly how I made it. 
um, it's basically just um, uh, and let me see if I can have it. Uh, it's basically just chords that I made with Chitulu. Don't know if you know that. And then uh, put the ARP on Chitulu, and that's that's what makes um, the ARP go like that. But like I said, it's not really a, a technical producing kind of uh, seminar at this point. Um, so that's that's kind of like how I how I get my references. I'm trying to I'm trying to be still be a DJ and produce and combine elements and then make it mine. So this for me is. Um, the bass line that's from Gabriel Ananda, totally other kind of music that I'm trying to make, um, that I'm trying to make myself. Can I um, ask you a question? Yeah, um, sure. Is it, so if I get it right, you, you get a lot of creative ideas from other music, from other tracks, from other vocals, from, but do you also start in a studio from scratch, like nothing? Mm. Is, is that, or is that for well, you? Well, the thing is, if, if, if I start from scratch, I can have an awesome day. But at the end, I might throw away a lot of hours just making, just doing nothing. So I kind of give my, like this for instance, um, I give myself like an assignment. Okay, I want to do this. I want to work with a sample. I want to start with something. Because everybody can lay chords down and make a melody. Everybody can make a beat. Everybody can make something rolling, an arrangement. But first, I want to find the, the, the essence of a song, the, the, the concept, the, the urgency. Is there a question? Oh. Oh, no. All right, I'll come to you, if you can stand up for me. In the first track you showed us, uh, you used a, a sample of uh, a different track, but don't you get problems with uh, copyright or something? No, we cleared it. We cleared it. Yeah, so, so it was on my label first. Um, I thought, you know, this is not going to be a really big track, so I won't clear it because it will be under the radar. And it's like a hard to find... I changed the vocal a bit, like uh, the key, and it's going to be hard to find. It's going to be under the radar, so I'm going to take that risk. But then Spinning liked it, and then Ministry of Sound, and if, like, if they want to invest money in it, obviously they have to clear it first. So I'll, I'll let them clear it. Sometimes I clear it myself, like the Montel Jordan track. We just send a mail to Montel Jordan's management saying, hey, you know, we want to use this, and they just literally said, yeah, $500, and you can use it. And we're like, okay, okay. <laughs> that's cool. So like no points or whatever, just okay. So um, um, so it's, it's more about, for me, finding the urgency of a track and the importance, no matter what I use for it. You know, we're going to make it work at the end. Or you, I'll, if, 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 if I can't clear it as a sample, you might want to re-sing it. Um, I actually show you something that I also do. Um, I can show it to you right now, basically. Um, like sometimes I can make, uh, find a sample and put the piano chords under it and a the rhythm. And then I make a song, like um, like I just showed you, like with the show. This is an example that I uh, made, um, where I have the vocal sample and the piano chords and a beat. I have the the essence of the song, the hook. I have the importance, the urgency. Just a demo, just really badly produced. Okay, so that's Paloma Faith. Um, it's it's not something that I thought of before. I, I didn't look to clear it, but it was just a demo that I had. Um, after a while, I started working with uh, top line writers. I'll go into that as well. Um, but for this track, I could sit with the top line writer and go, okay. Um, so I said to the top line writer, okay, we already have a hook. There is, there's already a hook. Okay, so he's singing I'll Be There, Paloma saying all these lies. So 
I already kind of like wrote the hook with the top line writer. I could even say to the top line writer that I wrote it because, well, basically Paloma Faith wrote it, but she's not going to use it like that. So in the end, um, for, in for example, this is the version that it's now. When you're feeling down and there's no one around, I'll be there, I'll be there. Yeah. When the sun is around, all you see is I'll be there. So it basically started with me combining those elements, like finding a vocal sample, putting some chords under it, and that being then the base for a whole new song, which there's no clearance involved, there's no copyright involved, it's, it's just a whole new idea. Um, but it started with me finding the sample, like, like you were asking, do you just start to make music? And I start to find, like, I could be in the studio the whole day and then come home, eat, sit in front of the t television with my laptop and just listen and dig online for vocals, a cappellas, cool samples, and just collect them, put them in the map, uh, uh, label them with the key, try to match them with um, uh, other um, backing tracks that I'm, or remixes that I might have made that weren't working or whatever, and then I try to try to match it. Um, so, just a um, quick thing about the the importance or the urgency that I want to create for myself. Like I said, this track with Gabriel Aranda, which I turn into another track. There's actually a vocal in there as well. Green rolls. I don't know if you know this song, but for Green me it's like has always won. a new one. Skip it a bit. Okay, so this is actually Pam Greer. Um, I, you know, if you don't know Montel Jordan, you probably don't know Pam Greer. Um, but Pam Greer was a black exploitation actress. Um, black exploitation were movies um, uh, that were made and um, uh, uh, directed and played by black people, which was like in the 80s, I think, something. And Pam Greer, this is not sh this is not her, by the way. <laughs> She's coming after this. Um, Pam Greer was the like the main uh, person in that scene because he played in uh, Foxy Brown, which was a really big uh, movie, and later on Jackie Brown from Quentin Tarantino. Don't know if you know that, that uh, um, uh, movie. So in this documentary, the, the guy is asking her, you know, um, why she did it, uh, what what her motivation was. And to do the things that we're doing now. So it was very confusing at that time. And basically, the dollar won. The green, not black. Green has always won. Okay, so she's basically saying that she never did it for any cultural stuff or any, like, um, for uh, her community or whatever. She just said, I'm doing it for the money, which I think is a really cool thing to tap into and to, to, to sample. So for me, there's urgency in it. I don't. I do obviously, at the end I care what other people think, but during my process at that moment, for me there's an urgency to finish that track, to use that sample, to, to give it a creative twist. Um, so that's just um, the last example of how... But, but the documentary li is like 40 minutes, do you watch the whole 40 minutes just to get like the right sample or the right line? Well, I actually wanted a kind of like a f somebody saying something funky, so I thought of Pam Greer, so I just skipped the documentary to where when she was saying stuff, and then I, I found that, but it's, yeah, it takes. But it's, I, I mean, it's fun. I, I think that's really fun to do, like just like digging and watching, and going, oh, this is nice, oh, that's nice, and just getting ideas. Um, so, although these, some of these tracks are newer, th this is one path that I use. This is just one way that I uh, make music, uh, because after my second or third track, uh, which was um, doing okay. It was actually the show that I just showed you. Um, I started going into this world with uh, top line writers. So basically when you have a bit of success as a DJ, you, you all might know it, um, you can have some top line writers or some vocalists that want to work with you because you, know, you are, are a platform for them to um, uh, put a song out into the world. 
um, which was for me very new. I didn't know anything about that. So um, obviously, um, uh, I got in touch, or Dragonette got in touch with me. She sent me uh, kind of like a, a rough idea for a chorus, and um, uh, that was this track. Fire. So that part, she sent me, um, I kind of worked, I made a house beat, I think it was like 100 BPM, I kind of made a house beat uh, underneath it. Then she started working uh, the verses, and then there wasn't a drop yet, I made like, I think I made like 20 drops, um, constantly send it to uh, uh, spinning, and the 20th drop they liked. Um, and for me, this was like kind of like the same way working with samples, only now there's just somebody sending me stuff. So it's still, it's still kicking off references. When I heard her voice, I thought of disco, but I wanted to also to do kind of like a house thing. So it's, it's for me, it's still kind of writing, but based on association, on references, on digging, on finding samples. Only now I don't need to find a sample, I get a top line sent to me, which I can choose, which I can choose from. The only thing that I think is a bit of a disadvantage when, I, when you work with top liners is that most top liners, they don't really care about how, how the DJ wants to express himself. They basically just want to write a song that's going to be a hit and they get money because they are not the artist on it. Well, Dragonette is, but there's loads of people that want to be like just on the background writing. So they don't really care about your uh, profile and the way how you express yourself. And um, I kind of felt that in the beginning, not with outlines, but with other tracks, like writing songs, but I still wanted to develop, you know, writing and, and doing more pop things. So, uh, you know, I still started develop developing that. And um, to come back to your question again, this is obviously, again, not an open pro project that I just started. I already have, like, a top line or an idea that I'm going to remix. So that's kind of the way that I um, that I'm doing stuff. <coughs> and uh, you were talking about, you know, uh, what I find special is that you have drum and bass sound, you have tech house sound, you have poppy sound, you have disco sound. Is that also for you? Like every time you just what you feel and what your message is for the track, uh, you you don't look for like certain borders. Well, I think yeah, no, I I, I in, in the beginning. I just look for the urgency and the hook and the, I, and the concept. If that's there, sometimes indeed there's like a, a top line or a cool sample that is pushing you in a way that's not like f is fitting your profile. But I'm still going to walk that path. Uh, well, at least I did a, lo uh, a long time because I wanted to develop myself as well. So there's kind of two things um, that influences you uh, as an as a artist. One, it's the, your profile, the way you want to express yourself. And the other is your development. Like how can you know how you're going to express yourself if you haven't explored all the things you are going to do? So you kind of have to develop, to develop all these things. So that's what I was thinking when I was writing more pop songs. Like might not be truly what I, how I want to profile myself in the end, but it's also part of the development. And you know, let's just go that route. So I don't want to be stuck too much um, in like a, a between borders. Um, especially not in my creative process. I don't want to kill ideas thinking this is not my profile. I just want to go, okay, this is, a, this is a cool idea no matter what, no matter who I am. It's just a cool idea, it's a cool, co cool concept, and I want, to, I want to develop it. But then if you see the promoter side, if they want to book Mike Magoo, what are they going to get? Yeah, okay, so that's, that's basically the problem that I, that I um, have um, uh, had now because I was so caught up with developing myself like go going all the way, uh, or going wide. Like I even made a more down tempo track, and and I'm happy as a producer. As a producer, I'm I'm super happy. I'm making I'm making nice songs. They are performing on Spotify, um, but as my my artist profile, you know, my my the, the expression point kind of uh, got um, on the side, and now I've noticed that okay. You know, 
I have developed myself now. I had some successes on Spotify. I have, I have touring successes. Now it's not going to... I don't have to value, how you say, validate my being here. I just have to find a way, find out how I want to make success, not that I want to make success. So now I'm at a point that I'm more focused on uh, how to express myself and how to build my profile and make that really clear. And luckily, even though it's kind of like broad what I produce, there are still some, some things that always come back like cool hooks, it's always feel good. There's always a kind of like left of the middle indie twist to it, although it's still commercial. So that's, I kind of, without paying so much attention to kind of find, find out who I, who I am and what I stand for in, in the long, on the long term. Um, so just um, maybe tapping into the, to the um, how I, then write songs. Uh, yes, I have to go with this. Um, the last track, the, the, the track before the last track that I made, um, is called Always On My Mind. And um, it's basically the same that I made all these tracks with top lines. So uh, I'll come back to the, to, to the point that you're saying again via, via this route as well. Um, that um, I got this track in. So, I don't know if you know this, but you get like, if you have a publisher or a manager, you sometimes get like a Dropbox link with loads of top lines, loads of demos. You can just choose and go, I want to work on that track. And um, y'all are going, okay, please can I have that Dropbox link as well? But um, this is just something that, that, that only works when people want to work with you because you have some name, because you, have, you already have a platform that um, people can release a song on. Um, so I got this demo. Okay, so I'm hearing this. It's just I want to tap into how I how I create um, how how the ideas come to me. When I hear this, I just I don't know about you, but I think about Brazilian beaches, like not beaches. Um, <laughs> so um, do you say bitches or beaches? Uh, beaches, yeah. Oh, beaches, right. Brazilian beaches. Um, Kind of funky, kind of like a cool vibe to it. Summary. Um, my first thought, and it, I don't know if it, even, if it even makes sense, but in my mind I'm going, oh, it's kind of like this track. It's totally different, but that's just my reference. It's kind of like the... So, it's not the same track, but I'm seeing Brazilian beaches, and I've seen Brazilian beaches when I've listened to this track. So I heard a track, see Brazilian beaches, and think, okay, all the tracks that I'm hearing right now, when I see Brazilian beaches, like sea, like <laughs> what's the other word for sand. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, and I also uh, think of like more Brazilian funk kind of things. And there's no rational, there's no rational reason why I'm thinking this when I heard that other track. It's just something that I think. At the same time, I was um, um, listening and watching um, Nightmares on Wax for a rooftop session. And he plays kind of disco stuff. And I thought, okay, I'm, I want to combine this vibe of a rooftop jam together with this summery, sunny kind of stuff. So it's going to be some kind of like a melodic, disco-y sound that might give you a bit of melancholy feel but still in a positive way. Um, so I basically came up with, um, it's going to be an instrumental because there's like a different story to it, but 
Um, so from here, which is the demo, I made it instrumental, which is, it's the disco from the kind of the, the funk from the rooftop that my reference was. Obviously there's still the guitar in it. But I wanted to make it really disco-y sounding, so... And later on... So I just want to have that, that rooftop vibe that he was having, that I was feeling, that I was going like, ah, oh, this would be cool if you just would be jamming some kind of disco stuff and it would be really musical and really cool and everybody would love this. And then the guy Sai, who wrote the song said, yeah, it's nice, but it's not that we, something we want to have. So then I'm like, ah oh, man, how, how how can you not like this? This is fucking epic, amazing, all these things together that I really love, you know, strings, vibey stuff. It might not be a really big radio hit, but it's it, you know, it has something. And um, well, then basically, there's the problem that you have with a top line writer and somebody that's thinking, you know, I, I just want to be creative. I just want to. I have all these references and. They keep asking me to change stuff, to change stuff, and I was like, ah, okay, okay, I will change it, but I, I don't really like the direction that it's going. And then they said, you know what, we're going to release a song ourselves, and thanks for your effort. And I was like, what? I I'd kind of like worked on this. I had like a whole strategy, all these ideas, produced it for a very long time. And um, actually then, at that point, Roger from Spinning, he mailed me asking, you know, do you have some new tracks? Do you have some demos? And I was like, yeah, I, I think I have this really gr great track, but it's kind of like, I don't know what to do with it. And he was like, this is really cool. This is amazing. You should, we should really work this to, uh, to something. And then in the end, I don't know if you know, do you know that song, Always On My Mind? Hands? Nobody knows it. Oh, it's you. Thanks for being polite. You know, I don't know it, but I'm still doing it. Right. Um, I'll show you the song really quick. So basically they released their version that they liked and I was like, okay, I'll license it in and release my track on remix terms, but on an, on my own original, on a, like an original title basis. Not as much, not as much as I wanted to. Um, so that's kind of, and you know, this 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 process is really frustrating because you know you 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 just spend all these this effort in 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 making the good concept for a song, producing it out. Then the top line writers want something different. You're like, ah, I don't want it, but okay, I'll change it. And then you change again, and you change again, and they're like, no fuck you, we're going to do something else. And I'm like, ah, what am I going to do? And I get really frustrated because it, it's kind of like stagnates your whole creative flow and, and what you want to do. do. Do you think that is, uh, that is wrong in the, uh, the, the scene right now that everybody wants that hit, is on their own island? They don't find that creative concept. They don't have the right feeling to make tracks, make music, actually. Do you think that's, that's wrong with the scene right now? Well, I mean, if, I, 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 first of all, the just scene, your opinion. The, so the nice. scene is, is is hard for me to like uh, define because the scene is, is so big. There are loads of people that are being creative, but I do think that that people like for me, it doesn't really work trying to make the next big uh, radio single because I'm doing it all the time. As uh, like like I'm saying, as a creative uh, like 
creative development, it's really nice because you kind of like create skills and, and, and develop skills. Um, but if it's your goal, then there's, then there's nothing in between, basically. There's nothing like a half a radio hit or like a could be radio hit. Like some, some people say, I produce commercial music. I mean, that's not a genre. That's like... Commercial is is a, is a, is, a, is, a, is the income of a song. That, you know how commercial it is is how much money it's gonna make. That's only the commercial value of it. So you can you can have like a really underground song with a catchy hook like Fisher losing it. You can you can say that's not a commercial song. Well, it is. He makes a lot of money with it. So on one point there's there's that, and then I think. Sometimes people are guided by by um, uh, bigger DJs like the Kelvin Harris or the Martin Garrix, and and they they say, okay, well he does it that way, I might do the same. But the thing is, these are people that have like millions of followers, so it doesn't really matter what they do. They you know it's going to be good, and people are going to like it because they are kind of celebrities. We are not celebrities, you know, so. The best thing that we can do first is kind of follow your f follow our passion, uh, expressing ourselves in our music, finding uh, creative um, validation for yourself and urgency in your songs, and hope to make a living out of it. That's kind of the goal. I mean, for me, I, I don't really m mind having loads of money and loads of fame, but. If I could sign now a contract, they'd be, yeah, your, your income will be okay, but you can make music the rest of your life. I'll be like, okay, hell, where can I sign? So that's basically what, I, what, I, what I'm looking for now. And I think for a lot of people, that's even because I'm, I'm doing demo drops the whole, the whole weekend, and I have a lot of producers coming to me and, and, and uh, saying things like, uh, yeah, I want to make... Yeah, uh, I make loads of music. I have this style, I have that style. What do you want to hear? And I'm like, ah, oh, man, you have to like find who you are. And that's a development. Like for me, it's it's like something that you also have to develop your technique, your skills as a songwriter, as a producer, and then you will you might know what you what you want to do or how you want to express yourself. So it's not bad in the scene. It's not a bad thing. I think it's just you know different. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to find out who you are and to express yourself in the first place. And it's logical that people want like, to have success with a big track. But there are so many people that want a radio hit. So there's so many people that want that big single. Or the, so it's, you know, it's a really tough and competitive market what, in, that, in that sense. Um, so, yeah, we have like, what should we do? Questions or? Are there any questions for the artists from Mike? I think you're very clear, man. Oh, wow. Wow. I didn't think I was... Oh, they're all clear. nervous. That's also a possibility. <laughs> yeah. All right, I have a question then, uh, regarding the last question as well. So you never start a track thinking, I should make a hit. Mm, I did, but it didn't work. Okay. Yeah. So I did a couple of... After, obviously, after Outlines, I, I people... You yeah, know, they expect a follow-up. Yeah, so I was expecting the follow-up myself as well. But then, I'm, I'm, the tracks were good on Spotify and they performed well. Uh, but you know, it's because the hit is main, so mainstream that you kind of want to uh, make everybody happy, and then you also put yourself in a kind of like a creative conflict because you j I just want to, you know, have some cool ideas and and express myself and my view on. I think we're losing the Martin Garrix fans, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, if there's <laughs> four, then it's okay. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we're doing quite well. <laughs> uh, I see a question over there. Let's try to get the question right. Could you stand up for me, please? Thank you. Uh, why didn't you release the, the track you really loved uh, on your own? Which one? The, the Brazilian beach. Ah, okay. The, yeah, so, beach. I, so, so in the end, yeah. So in the end, the, the top line writers... Of the, the who, who who made the vocal, they didn't want they didn't like the direction and the end product, so they wanted to release their own version. So in the end, I ca and and then I kind of made my version on the remix terms, sent it to Spinning, but then Spinning said, okay, we have to take away some elements. 
So the strings and everything, yeah, they, they kind of left because uh, they just didn't th think it was strong enough. And I was already kind of like thankful that they were so enthusiastic and picking it up and helping me. So I was like, okay, we'll, we'll lose that as well. All right, I think that's it for right now. Um, I want to thank you, man, because you gave me also, it's really nice to just see somebody that makes music for the love of making music and telling a story. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, make some a big applause for Mike Magoo. Thank you.